mixed all the questions together and anything that people are interested in about the film or about life or about science or how they all intermingle uh, together. All right, so maybe some of you noticed in that film that there's a lot of similarities, at least on the surface, between Oil City, where the movie takes place, and between uh, your local town of Rattleman. I mean, they look a lot the same. The river's running through the town, and the old bridges, and the old factory buildings. And there's some uh, similarity, similarities also in the way that they're both sort of struggling to find economic vitality after the main industries have left town. But you may have also noticed, I certainly have, that there are a lot of differences between Rattleman. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's a really kind of an interesting question about, well, why in the same country, in the same type of little town, are there such huge differences? And of course, that is a very complicated, multidisciplinary, uh, multi-layered, textured sort of question with a lot of different answers. But I think that two of the factors that are important are, first of all, people's knowledge and attitudes about why people are gay in the first place. And the other issue that's very important and plays such an important role in this and many other parts of American society is what people think of believe about religion and what their faith is. Um, those are really two prominent, uh, important factors that drive the differences between places like Oil City and Rattle World. And so that begs the question, why are there individual differences in these aspects of your personality. Why doesn't everybody think the same? And um, I just want to talk about a little bit of biological research, which suggests that some of the reason, part of the reason, is because of differences in people's innate biology. Uh, we all accept that there are differences in biology that affect uh, how fast you can run, or uh, how skillful you are at a particular trait, how tall you are, what your body weight is. Uh, but there are also differences in our genetics that affect the way that our brains work, the way that our brains process information, and that have uh, influence on some of these important traits. So first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the current state of scientific knowledge about a question that maybe shouldn't be important, but is important, and it's the question of what makes people gay, or for that matter, what makes people straight. And even though from a political point of view, View, perhaps this shouldn't really be prominent. In fact, when you go into a town like Oil City or many other little towns, one of the first questions on people's mind is, well, why are they like that anyway? It's just, it doesn't seem like it's natural. So over the time, if you show the next slide, um, there have been a lot of questions or answers that people have given to the question of what makes people gay. And over most of the time, religion has been the major purveyor of information. And the answer from religion is, well, they're bad people. They're sinners and that. Uh, next slide. Others have thought that perhaps it's because you come from a bad family. Uh, and your dad was too close or not close enough. Your mother was the same. I forget exactly how it works. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, later on, <laughs> in modern lives, we've had social learning models that says basically you learn from people. So, uh, you know, if your daughter watched too much more than that, Lobo or that other guy, whoever he is, then that's what made him gay. Or the next slide. Or lastly, there's the idea that it's an individual choice, that people really choose to be gay in the same way that you chose to come to Marlboro College or you decided to wear your shoes or not wear your shoes to this lecture tonight. <laughs> um, so it's only in more recent times that people have had the idea that there might be a biological influence. And really the main reason for that is shown in the next slide which is that in a lot of ways, the question one should be asking is not what makes people gay, but what makes people heterosexual. Because after all, most people are heterosexual, and that's always been true in all societies. And of course, the automatic answer that comes to most people is, well, it's natural, which is a code word for saying, well, it's biological. And indeed, heterosexuality has to have a very strong genetic inherited component for the very simple reason that, after all, it's sex by which we pass our genes on to the next generation. So of all of the traits that you can have, the one that is most strongly selected in evolution is having children. That is the only thing that you actually have to do as an evolutionary being 
is to pass on your genes and have children. You don't have to eat, you don't have to have a house, you don't have to have territory. All you have to do is pass on your genes. So there must be some sort of strong genetic component in humans as in all other living creatures which drives people uh, to have a sexual orientation. Well, a lot of research uh, on sexual behavior suggests that the major components are people's genes. That's where the information is stored. In uh, mammals such as ourselves, sexual hormone, which is how sexual differentiation actually occurs, hormones like testosterone, for example, which cause the formation of all of the secondary sex characteristics, and the influence of those hormones and genes on the brain, which is, uh, of course, our response organs and how we respond to the environment, including the sexual environment. So as soon as you realize that there's some sort of biological pathway, some sort of perhaps hardwired pathway that's involved in heterosexuality, it doesn't take long to realize that if there are minor variations in those hormones or in those genes or in those brain receptors, <laughs> that those could readily account for variations in sexual orientation. And since our genomes are so variable and there's so much variation that occurs in biology, such changes or such differences are almost inevitable. So the real question then is trying to track down some of those differences and understand them a little bit better so we can understand better how sexuality actually works. To the next slide, please. Okay, well, of course, as a scientist, we can't just theorize about this stuff. We actually have to make measurements and look at correlations. And to do that, we need some sort of measuring tool. Well, for sexual orientation, this was first really studied by Alfred Kinsey, the pioneer of sex research back in the 1940s. Uh, perhaps some of you saw the wonderful movie about him. And he was the one who first uh, derived some sort of scale called the Kinsey scale to measure sexual orientation. It's a very simple linear scale. It goes from zero for people that are completely attracted to the opposite sex or heterosexual up to six for complete homosexuality or attraction to the same sex, and all of the gradations in between. And Kinsey actually developed this scale to show that there was variation in human populations and that there are people at all edges of this scale. Um, as it turns out, at least in modern American populations, most people, at least most males, tend towards one end or the other. That is, most men are pretty strongly heterosexual or they're pretty strongly gay. Um, women are actually a lot more variable. There are certain women all over the scale from zero to six and everything in between. And whether those differences are really more social or biological is something that people are still debating about. At any rate, we have a way that we can measure people's sexual orientation. So now we can start asking questions like, why is there variability? And for geneticists, the two tricks for doing that are to study twins and to study adoptees. Okay, twins are much beloved by geneticists like myself because you have the two types. You have identical twins. They have exactly the same DNA. They're clones. And then you have non-identical twins or fraternal twins. They share about 50% of their DNA, just like ordinary siblings do. And so by comparing identical twins to non-identical twins to unrelated people, you can get some idea of whether genes are important by looking at how similar the traits are. Adoptees are just the other idea. Adoptees are individuals who are brought into the same family, so they have the same parents and the same environment, yet they have no genetic similarity except the same similarity that you or I or anybody else in this auditorium does. So you can actually use adoptees to start measuring quantitatively the effects of the environment. This experiment has been done many times looking at sexual orientation starting back in the 1950s. There have been a lot of um, questions about the methodology and how accurate uh, the experiments are. But it's just in the last two years that two really large population studies have been done. One by a group in Australia and another uh, by a group in Virginia. And these are big studies where tens of thousands of twin pairs are identified, sent anonymous questionnaires, and then analyzed very carefully. And just a summary of those slides. Um, is shown there, looking at how heritable sexual orientation is, that is how important genes are. And when that sort of analysis is done, genes account for around 50% of the variability. That is about 50% of the reason that some people are gay and some people are straight and some people are bisexual is because of their genetic makeup. 
The shared environment, the environment that you get from living in the same house and going to the same schools and having the same parents is relatively unimportant. For males, it seems to have almost no effect at all. For females, perhaps uh, some of the effect, but not really huge. Now, you might be wondering what happened to the rest of the variants. There's something missing in this equation. There's also just a lot of random noise, and we don't know what it is. We don't know if it's biology, or somebody sneezed on you at the wrong time, or you saw Marina Natrolova, or Russell Simmons was on the TV when you were watching it. We just don't understand it. But genes are one of the most important factors. Okay, so that's all well and good, but what does it really mean? What are the genes doing? Uh, how does a gene in your brain suddenly make you attracted to one person or to another? Well, that's the question scientists are struggling with now. And one of the first steps, if you show the next slide, is to start looking at how sexual orientation is sort of passed down in families. This is a good way of looking at things that are genetic, because things that are genetic always have some sort of inheritance pattern. Well, for sexual orientation, it's not simple. It's not like having a black hair or blue eyes, for example. You can't trace things down in families exactly. But if you look at a lot of families of gay men in particular, a really interesting pattern emerges, which is that most gay men have their gay relatives on the mom's side of the family. And if you look at that little family tree chart on the left there, where circles are women and, and squares are guys, and you look where the black guys, or black the filled in squares are, those are the gay guys, they're mostly on the right side of the pattern, which is where the mom's genetic information is. And sometimes you'll even see families where this seems to go on for three or four uh, generations and it involves all sorts of interesting combinations of relatives. So to a geneticist, that's really interesting because it suggests that there's something on the X chromosome that might be involved. Why is that? Remember, men only have one X chromosome. Their other sex chromosome is a Y chromosome, which they get from their dad. So men always get their X chromosome from their mom. And it, things can only pass down to the mother's side of the family. That's what led us back in 1993 to actually look at the DNA of gay men's X chromosomes and to see if there was anything similar in the gay guys that was not shared by heterosexual guys. And we did something called a linkage study, which actually uses little anonymous markers on DNA, tiny bits of variability similar to what are used to uh, trace uh, DNA samples in, in semen or blood, for example and to compare gay guys in the same family to their straight, uh, their heterosexual brothers. And that led to the complicated graph on the right-hand side, which is called a linkage map, which identified one area of the X chromosome that does seem to be related to sexual orientation. And it's called XQ28. It's linked very significantly set to sexual orientation. And it contains a gene that somehow is dissolved in tipping the scales as to whether people are gay or straight. We still don't know exactly what that gene does in the brain, although we have some hints. Uh, there's still a relatively small amount of research being done. But we know there's something directly in the genetic information there that's important. Subsequent research has shown that this is certainly not the only gene. There's not one thing that makes people gay. We know of at least three other linkages on other chromosomes already. Uh, and other people have proposed a lot of other candidate genes. So that's very much well, some of you who are interested in the intersection between science and society might be saying, so what? So what if it's genetic or not? Why should that have any influence on people's perceptions or people's attitudes or on laws or anything else? And the next slide just shows that uh, we actually have data on this question. And the reason that we have data is that for the last 20 years, the National Opinion Survey uh, as well as other surveys such as this one from CBS News, have been asking people, do you think that being gay is a choice, or do you think that people are born that way? Essentially asking, do you think it's voluntary, or do you think that it's genetic? And it turns out right now in American society, uh, the population is divided about 50-50, uh, almost exactly. It actually just crossed up to the 52% who are born that way uh, this last uh, six months ago. So sort of cross the divide. But basically, people are split in their opinions. What effect does that have on how people think about other aspects of basic civil rights for gay people? Uh, it turns out it has a tremendous effect. The next slide. So for example, if you ask people, um, do you think that there should be gay marriage? These are people outside of Vermont, where everybody is cool. 
Uh, it turns out that people that think that being gay is a choice, by and large, say, no, there should not be gay marriage. Absolutely not. And those who think that you're born that way, 70% of them say, yeah, gay marriage, fine, no problem. An even more striking piece of data shown on the next slide, when you ask the same people, do you think that gay relations should be illegal? And now, if you ask people that think that being gay is a choice, more than 70% of them think that no, being gay should be illegal. And we should reinstitute sodomy laws and you should be put in jail for being gay. So um, that means me and Joe and probably some of the people in this room would be in jail now instead of sitting free in Marlborough College. So it has a tremendous effect. And a lot of additional research shows that this isn't just because people who are liberal or who live in Vermont think that it's not a choice. It actually by itself is an important factor. So this is one of those examples where people's knowledge about the way the science is, about the way the world is, about the way people are, um, has an influence on their attitudes and ultimately on people's basic rights and on the laws that we have that govern our land. Okay, so next slide. Oh, by the way, if you think that this is not true, then just Google my name and see how often it comes up on uh, groups like this. This is a ministry to uh, address homosexual issues, and by that they mean to cure homosexual people. Um, a lot of these sites cite this research and really vehemently protest uh, against it because it's very much against the, uh, the right wing or the very conservative philosophy that being gay is a choice and it's not born that way and that uh, we should suppress any research on this topic at all. Okay. So that brings up uh, the next question, uh, which is the question of what makes people anti-gay. And at least in our country, the two main correlates are uh, religion, and especially certain forms of organized religion, uh, and conservatism. And so, I an interesting question to start pondering, well, where does that come from? Now, in this case, most people are going to think right away, well, it's what you learn. And indeed, that is a very major factor, no doubt about it whatsoever. But how you learn and how susceptible you are to learning and to ideas may also be influenced by one's personality, which at least in part is based in genetics. The next slide. So one point I want to make about this is that when we start talking about religion and stuff, uh, definitions become very murky. Uh, this is not as easy to measure as sexual orientation because religion, spirituality, these are pretty complex things and even in the Department of Religion I'm sure there's a lot of debate about exactly how to define it. But the one point I do want to make is that there does seem to be some sort of difference between spirituality and religiousness. And by spirituality I'm talking about people's individual or internal feelings uh, it's a universal trait, and uh, it seems in part at least to be driven by genes. So these are feelings like, uh, I think the universe is larger than just what I'm seeing right now. I think there's a connection between me and other things. This sort of general feeling that there's something else out there. Religion, by contrast, is something that's always practiced by groups, uh, not by individuals. Uh, it's very external, involves a lot of rules. You can eat this, you can't eat that, your skirt has to be that length, etc. Get to wear a screw. It's very culturally specific and it's very different between one society and another, which right away says this is not something biological or genetic because things that are genetic can't really be that different between one culture and another. The next slide uh, just shows a really interesting series of studies that were again done on twins and shows that if you try to measure the heritability of spirituality on the one hand, and of religious conservatism on the other hand, that they are very different. So the way that spirituality is measured is actually by a questionnaire, a favorite tool. It asks questions like, do you often feel a strong sense of unity with all the things around you? Or do you sometimes feel so connected to nature that everything seems like one living organism? Yes answers, more spiritual. No answers, less spiritual. This is actually called the self-transcendence scale, and there's a whole interesting literature. Religious conservatism is actually pretty easy to measure. We simply ask questions like, do you think the Bible is literally true? Or do you think that abortion is always wrong? Very culturally specific, but in our country, in our culture, have quite specific meanings. So when you do that, what you can see is that spirituality, being spiritual, looks like being gay. Uh, it's largely infected 
uh, affected by one's genes. <laughs> That's another theory which we won't go into tonight. Uh, it's largely affected by one's genes and has remarkably little influence for one's specific environment. That is from what your parents teach you. So your parents may make you a Protestant or a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim, but they don't really have much influence on how much you get into it, on how spiritual you are and how connected you feel. The conservative beliefs, on the other hand, are largely environmental. So people don't just naturally feel that the Bible is literally true. That's something that you very much learn from your culture and the radio stations and, and your parents and the like. So no big surprise, but again, the interesting question is, well, what genes could be involved in this? How could there be a gene that makes you feel connected with uh, the rest of the universe? Well, most college students will tell you that the thing that makes them feel connected to the entire universe and everybody else is either ecstasy or uh, uh, cocaine or marijuana or LSD. And we're laughing because we know it's true. But what do those drugs actually do in the brain? Well, they affect a series of chemicals in the brain, which are known as the monoamines. Chemicals like dopamine, which is the brain's reward chemical, and makes you feel good when it's tipped off. Chemicals like serotonin, which make you feel anxious, and when you suppress it, make you feel much less anxious and also much more affable to other people. Well, it turns out at least one gene that's involved in spirituality has now been identified. Uh, it's one of many different players, and the next slide shows it. It's something called the vesicular monoamine transporter number two. There are actually more than a dozen of them. And what it codes for is a little protein that sits on the edge of brain cells and controls the levels of all of the different monoamines. So it's sort of like a controller drug for ecstasy. It's sort of like a controller drug for Prozac in the brain and has an important influence on how we perceive consciousness, how we perceive the world around us, and how we emotionally respond to it. And we think that somewhere, somehow, that's involved in our consciousness and spirituality uh, in much the way, same way that drugs trip it off. But this is sort of like a natural spiritual high. And everybody has this gene, everybody has the potential of spirituality. But some people, next slide, have one particular version of the gene that has two A's on the two different strands, the two different chromosomes, I should say. And other people have a C on one chromosome, and other people have one A and one C. And that slight difference in the genetic code actually makes a difference in how well the protein works and in how much of this monomene transporter is uh, available to then handle the different monomenes in the gene. And if you look at those little graphs there, it just shows that there is a subtle difference in the distribution of spirituality or self-transcendence scores, which correlates with what particular genotype people have. So again, this is by no means a determinant. It's not something that makes you spiritual or non-spiritual. Uh, but it is something that tips the scales to some extent and really makes people more or less susceptible or more or less open to spiritual experiences. Okay. So I think that's enough of science. Uh, and I'm just going to sum up by saying, first of all, that I, I really want to emphasize that I don't think that genetics should ever be used as the basis for any argument about human rights. Human rights are something that all humans have. And whether it's biological or not is unimportant and should really not enter into the fundamental debate at all. But we also know from fact uh, evidence, next slide, that these genetic arguments do influence public opinion and that they're really important. If you go to any of the churches that are now really struggling with this issue, the Lutheran Church, for example, or the Methodist Church, one of the first things that they want to know is, well, why are people gay? Do they choose to be that way or is it naturally? And they're really asking that question in a sincere way. Um, the way I look at it is that since the other side is promoting so much untruth and falsehoods about the nature of sexual orientation, it's important to at least have the facts available to people so that they can make up their own minds. And the last slide just emphasizes that um, sometimes we think that maybe science will replace religion. You know, we'll all live in a better world. Everything will be fact-based. It's never going to happen. Spirituality, this belief in something else, is part of our human makeup. 
It's not going to be replaced by scientific fact. Scientific fact just doesn't have the same emotional appeal that, that religion or spirituality does. But the important point is that a lot of the specific teachings of religion, specific teachings like you have to go to church on Sunday or all gay people are bad, those have nothing to do with our genetic makeup. Those are indeed cultural phenomena and they can be guided by rationality, by science, and uh, by the way that people react. So that's the end of the science talk. And I really want to open it up a little bit. Um, I hope you can see some connection to the film that uh, Joe and I made. Uh, that's not a didactic film, but some of the issues, the religious issues, the issues about that white people are gay, maybe are part of it. So um, I'd really like to open up things for myself, and I'm sure Joe is also a very interesting big part of it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I was Really, I'm really interested in this, uh, this just for sure, they call it the spirituality gene or whatever. Um, but I, I was thinking, um, in a way, this is just how I was starting the mind works. Um, you know, you said that this influence of depression of dopamine um, and that that makes people uh, more open to spiritual experiences. So, in a way, uh, I often hear, like, religious people always say to me, or spiritual people will say to me, you know, when I'm so much happier this way. Um, some sort of sexual orientation. Or at least people used to think that until, you know, gay Stonewall happened and all of a sudden it, uh, all kinds of gay people started coming out, whether right. they were more masculine or whatever. And I was wondering if you had done any studies that correlated some of those other genetic aspects in terms of those things. Yes, that's a really interesting question. And of course, uh, gay men and lesbians come in all flavors, uh, all, all degrees of masculinity and of femininity. But it is also true that there's a very strong correlation, especially between childhood masculinity and femininity, as we define it, uh, and people's adult sexual orientation. So it is a, a strong correlate. Uh, there have been twin studies of such childhood uh, gender-related behaviors, and it's strongly heritable. And especially in the case of women, there was a really strong core, cross correlation with adult sexual orientation. So they are probably tied up together in similar pathways, although there's probably branching points higher up. So you can be gay and be you know, really masculine or uh, butch, or you can be lesbian and be really feminine. But they're often also correlated, probably because somewhere in the genetic tree, there's a branching off where like, this is orientation and this is, uh, this is gender identity. And depending on where the changes are, that's, that's what the influence is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to note when you were talking about Royal City and Brattleboro, Brattleboro has many, many, many churches. You also have the Brattleboro Reformer on uh, Friday, and all the services are li listed for whatever denomination you want. And they're all here, and there are a lot. 
I think that's a good example of um, their, you know, their spirituality and people that want or people that want to go to church everywhere. But what the churches teach, I bet, is a lot different in Brattleboro than it is in Iowa City. Um, as a, you know, somebody living in Washington D.C., I was kind of amazed reading the newspaper accounts about uh, the, the marriage bill here, the marriage equality bill, and we're so used to seeing. You know, a paragraph about people want equality, and then the second paragraph is always, but the family association said, and they had a big protest, and they called up everybody. And I kept on, I was looking at the Vermont papers, like, where is the, where's the American Family Association? Where are the bad guys? <laughs> like, apparently, um, the cultural view, obviously, here is very different. So I think everybody, church is popular for everybody on, on both sides, and it's always going to be. But what those churches chief teach can be. Given that uh, homosexuality doesn't um, um, reproduce the genes, are there any theories as to why still the certain population? Yes. So this is a big question. Gay guys don't have kids. Of course, some people, gay guys do. I don't know. Uh, great daughter. We should have covered this college. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a really good theory with some evidence behind it now for the gay gene. So imagine a gene that makes men sexually attractive. Okay, you like men, right? If you're a guy and you get that gene, you're gay, so all of a sudden you think guys are hot. What happens when a female gets that same gene? Okay, that'll be now a woman that thinks guys are really, really super hot. And she's more likely to go out and have babies. So you might be thinking, oh, this is just another storytelling, blah, blah, blah. So there's now actually quite extensive uh, evidence from a group in Italy and another group in England looking at families of gay men and showing that the female relatives on the mother's side that have the, the gene um, have higher fecundity and have a higher number of children. Hmm. So it turns out in nature, this is a very, when you have a gene that does something that's good for one sex, it can be balanced out by doing something evolutionarily bad for the other sex, and it, it works out perfectly. And for genome, the X chromosome is super cool because women have twice the probability of getting the gene because they have two X chromosomes instead of one. So it doesn't have to make the woman that much, you know, more heterosexual uh, in our family. <laughs> yeah. Me? Sure. Uh, two things. I just wanted to say the film was wonderful, even though maybe rough cuts and great. And I want to put in a plug. I'm an advisor for a gay straight alliance in a regional high school, middle school in rural western Massachusetts. And I know my students would absolutely love that movie. I wondered if you're going to make it available to school schools on a, you know, a wide basis, because I think it would be excellent. Um, that would be great. And um, the other just observation, it's really fascinating looking at the correlation between the numbers of people, the percentage who believe that sexual orientation is a choice, and how many of them also would like to see laws or feel that laws are important to restrict human sexual behavior. Because I'm thinking and I have observed politically that this group is skewed toward people who are struggling with their own sexual orientation and perhaps have religion coming down within them, making them feel that they are exercising a choice not to express what might be their homosexuality or bisexuality. And they're feeling the need for laws to ensure that they get some extra help doing that. <laughs> I think that that group of people who feel it's a choice. I mean, so many of us, our society is essentially a laboratory for producing heterosexuals. We, from day one, are in, completely surrounded by the societal message that this is the acceptable way to be and the mainstream way to be, and yet we have a pretty continual proportion of gay, straight, or questioning, or LGBT people, despite this great societal brainwashing that our culture gives people. So most people who think you're exercising a choice probably are, on a daily basis, trying to control their own impulses. So it's just a lot my of theory about it. Um, okay. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting studies, actually, on whether, especially homophobic people, also are a little bit more you know, questioning themselves and, and, and some support. Yeah, and it's not necessarily that I'm slamming them. I, I mean, obviously, they live in maybe a conflicted state, but it no. might be a little bit skewed that group that believes it's a choice, maybe people who are struggling. So. Uh, I'm sort of thinking about, I've talked to people who, who are queer who feel like um, their sexual orientation is a choice for them, or that's their subjective experience of it, and I'm sort of curious uh, how that is. 
Yeah, I think for some people it is. There's no question about that. And none of these are absolute uh, controls. And you saw even, you know, the, the identical twin of a gay guy has a 50% chance of being gay, which is pretty high. But he's a 50% chance of being straight. So it's not the same for everybody. Um, I think for women, there's probably at least a lot more reports of it being more um, based on affiliation or, or, or choice than for men. Uh, but that's true for heterosexuals too, you know. I mean, heterosexual guy, like there's no heterosexual guy that I decided to be heterosexual. I've never heard of that. But I think there are a lot of women who say, well, I, at least I chose this partner or I chose to be married. It's more of a choice. So I'm not like an absolute determinist who's saying it's all. There's something that's really interesting, like, that this is such a there's such a political motive to say it's not a choice, and yet that sometimes undercuts people who do it. I think it, it, it is a very bad political strategy to depend on it being not a choice. Because it'll backfire in multiple ways. First of all, if it is a choice, so that, what's that mean? Okay, you don't get your rights. You can't, you know, you can't marry because you just think you're gay. I think that's ridiculous. And second of all, because there are things that are biological that we should legislate against. Like, you know, if it turns out that pedophilia has a strong genetic component, which probably will, that doesn't make it right. It's wrong because it hurts another individual and, and breaks his rights. Um, so the idea of basing, you know, fundamental rights or laws or even political strategy on nature, bad idea. I'm against it. Yeah. So, like, curiously, the graph that shows the uh, percentage of people who thought it was by gay, gay biological men. The next slide just shows the percentage that thought um, there should be laws against it. And we still like, with like 20, 30 percent of those who thought it was biological thought there should be laws against it. And that seems like a curious cohort. I'm wondering if you know anything about it. I've always been wondering about that. <laughs> Usually, like 5 or 10 percent of that are people that didn't understand the, the question. Uh, and then, um, but actually, it's an interesting point because, for example, the Catholic Church. Says, oh yes, it may be natural. Some people may be bored that, but it's still a sin to act on. Right. And you should become a priest. <laughs> 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 so they're, not, yeah, they're not completely exclusionary. <laughs> There, you know, actually, let me say first of all that John Scagliotti is, is here, who's another filmmaker, but he's working on an interesting film called Before Homosexuality, mm -hmm. which looks at things in different types of cultures. Because, of course, in the United States, we don't have any women dominated uh, societal aspects. Uh, who may be able to say more about that. Uh, but there is a lot of misogyny and, and, and homophobia are closely related to one another. And part of the reason that people are so anti effeminate men. Is this idea that being a woman is bad. Whereas tomboys are like, oh, that's so cute, you know. Uh, <laughs> to a certain extent. Uh, so uh, I think it's an interesting, an interesting area for exploration. I don't know if John knows that. Well, yes, I, my journey is still going on and I'm enjoying it very much, but it is uh, it's very interesting the cultural differences uh, in terms of uh, patriarchy and uh, matriarchal societies and, and, and some of those differences in sexuality, too, in, in, in those kinds of uh, cultural experiences. Uh, you know, but uh, it's all still kind of fresh in a way, even though it's historical, it's still, I mean, to understand it and to figure out what it means is, 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 is something that modern people like yourself are doing that, that I think is still needed to be done. I mean, we can tell we can help people that these things are happening and these things did happen and it opens up the mind to ask the question, why? But it doesn't answer. Uh, it only says that there are these differences, which then call the question about your your reality because the different realities exist. 
And so therefore, where did, where did your reality, where did your normalcy, where did all these things come from? And by opening up those questions, that's what sort of my film I'm trying to do, is just open up the questions that we've had such diversity in sexuality and diversity in same sex and diversity in different cultures that perhaps what we have now is not necessarily uh, the norm. The norm. Yeah. Um, I was told once that uh, the chances of being gay um, increases for each son that your mother has. Um, and I'd assume that's hormonal. So is it possible that genetics and hormones can? Yeah, it's, it, it, the observation is that um, the more older brothers a uh, uh, guy has, the more likely he is to be gay. That's actually held up really well in a lot of studies. It's not a huge effect, it's maybe 5 or 10% of variance, but it is quite consistent. And it actually, um, it accords with some interesting sort of anthropological stuff, like in Polynesian societies, where uh, quite frequently the last son will be sort of like treated as a girl, a mom, as it's called, uh, who helps take care of the family. And people always say, oh, that's because the parents want somebody to take care of them. But you can't just like take some little straight boy and say, okay, you dress up like a girl, you know, go <laughs> tea for me. Just <laughs> So um, there's probably a lot of truth. The mechanism isn't known. Uh, one theory is hormonal. Uh, they actually, the female makes uh, antibodies against testosterone, I think. Yeah, and the other is um, some sort of uh, some sort of immunological type of mechanism. So it's it's an observation. It doesn't. It's not true for women.
help form something called Starting, a small town and rural human rights network that will make resources more available to kids like CJ. Uh, when CJ went into the, you know, the internet and used it in his library in this town, we actually went into this experiment. Do you like Google? You know, okay. It's not as easily accessible as it is. And when you try to figure out where in your little town, where within driving distance there might be allies, that was, it was really good. We hope for kids like CJ and jillions of other little towns and conservative areas all throughout the country. One, one last question. Yeah. And, you know, for me, that would have been it. I, I would not have been like, let's have dinner next 